yeah. Hey, 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 it's an occupation, it's a celebration, it is history. Or in this case, it's mm, some interesting what if history because this is looking at the Anglo Sino War in February 1939. If Sing Tan Sin goes hot, what would I be IJ in doctrine? Now, this, of course, is a patron question from Dan Freeman. And I put a note saying, please listen to the whole thing before commenting, thank you, because there are going to be some leaps here. There are going to be me filling in some points, because honestly, we have a very different scenario if war starts out in 1939. And first of all, I'm going to start off by looking at the doctrine and how it developed in, ja in the Japanese Navy by 1939. I'm going to look at the Navy available to them, and to an extent available to the Royal Navy. But that, the, the, what's available to the Royal Navy is going to have slightly less of an impact to the IGN than what is available to them. Because whatever's available to them, in February 1939, the odds are the Royal Navy has a lot more. Remember, this is a January 1939 incident, so war's broken out. And I'll even have a scenario which I think is likely to have led to war. So it's basically, it all hinges, hinges on the decision of one officer. Now, before I get into that, I have to say thank you to something. And I honestly don't know if it's still this figure by the time this comes out on the 19th of March, which is a uh, special day for another reason to me. But it is £3,400 out of £3,600 raised with five days to go because this is. On the 17th of March. And um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are watching the costs and sort of working things out, but I'm hopeful I'm going to be definitely able to add in Odua, Odua and uh, Little Rock and the Sullivans. Well, if I can add a day, I think if I can extend our stay in Hamilton by a day, we can do that. We need to rent a car, but we can do that. We, we've got a we've got a, a a good relationship with the car rental company, uh, thanks to my relationship with them in the UK. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think um, that's possible. So if we did that, then we would be extending the end date a bit and staying in Hamilton a little bit longer. But uh, I think we can do this. We can have a talk and see. Overview, as said. We're starting off with the Japanese doctrine, which I know I've gone through before, but I feel I need to go through it again because there is the Japanese doctrine as I've taught, which was mostly when I was talking about it reflecting on Pearl Harbor and the Japanese doctrine as it exists in 1941. Doctrine is a very much a living document. Doctrine is a very much something which is in constant evolution. And this means that the doctrine that exists in 1941 can actually be said to be quite different to the doctrine which existed in 1939. Also because doctrine also reflects what you have available to implement it. There is no point having a doctrine calling for a decisive carrier strike if you only have one carrier available. There really isn't. It's like having a doctrine of forward operations if you only have three ships in service. You're not going to have cheap. You need at least four. Um, it's why I find it funny when I'm looking at various navies going, oh yes, we're going to forward base these ships. Okay. You going to maintain them? Um, how are you going to maintain them? It's quite... Uh, let's put it this way. There is a reason why the Royal Navy is using the general purpose Type 23s as their forward base ships, i.e. Montrose, rather than one of the very, very high techy ASW Type 23s, because there's an acceptable risk limit. There's also a reason why the Type 31s are being built as they are, which some people haven't picked up, is if you're going to be forward basing them, well, they're not going to be returning home all the time for their maintenance. So you have to put what equipment on them to an extent is not going to be a security concern if it gets compromised by a dockyard worker. Not that I'm saying we can't trust the dockyard workers or anything in the foreign place. You, you can, up to a limit. 
there's a point at which beyond which it's stupid to do so because you're just putting risk out there to tempt fate. And then looking at the Singtone and Sonant, likely conflict on a summary. So, Japanese strategy. Well, oh, would it be a decisive battle doctrine and who would decide? Well, this is an interesting one. Sardas, we have some very interesting officers involved. And I've already looked at them a bit in the Chief of Staff uh, of the Japanese Navy. And it's worthwhile going and checking out that video series, Chief of Staff Axis. And it asks this Chief of Staff again to hear about the uh, Japanese Navy if you're interested. There will be a link down below to that as well in this as well as in the live. Um, Admiral Sami Nagano uh, left the role of Navy Minister to take over after Mitsu, uh, Mitsumasa Yonai's 62 days in post. And that is, of course, the gentleman on the top left of those, that lovely bank of officers. And I've included officers in here who come into post well after 1939. But it's worthwhile thinking about because Admiral Isio, uh, Isoroku Yamato is appointed in August 1939. So, and he's appointed by Admiral Mitsumasa Yonai who is the Navy Minister at that point. Because Yonai basically leaves command of the forward fleet and the, far, uh, the main fleet to go and become the commander, the, the, the Navy Minister, and is a very important officer at that point. As uh, for that's when Admiral Osama Nagano takes over. But he isn't, and Nagano is not in post for long because he's replaced by Vice Admiral Zengo Yoshida, Who's in post up until uh, up until August 1939. Now Zengo Yoshida is the central officer. He is the one between Nagano and Yamato on there on the top row. So the Royal Navy would not be facing off unless the Japanese rapidly change their officers around, which of course they can do, against Yamato. They would be chasing off, uh, facing off against Yoshida. Yoshida is a fine officer, but how do I put it? If Yamato is a Jellico, and that is certainly, if I was looking at personalities, where I'd be heading for. And Nagano is a BT. Yoshida is a Wilson. I would say Yonai. He's not. A, uh, he he's not a a fish or anything like that. But he is certainly someone worth thinking about. But the point is, that is the, the officer at the top there is the one who they're going to be dealing with. The Royal Navy is going to have to worry about him and his decision. So the moment you start thinking about this sign of scenario of what happens if war goes hot, and I'm not including anything about reference of what do the Germans get up to, etc. I do think you have to consider what the Americans would get up to. My reason being, any war in between Britain and Japan in the Far East is going to affect the American position. And the Americans are far more likely to dive into a war in the Far East than they are to dive into a war in Europe. War in Europe, they don't want to get involved in, but a war in the Far East, they're honestly, to an extent, spoiling for. They and Japan have been squaring off against each other for a long time. If Britain takes out Japan, which America will presume Britain's going to, there are both. There are three factions in America who presume that. There's the racists who, or white supremacists, whatever you want to call them. They're going to presume America's uh, the Britain will win against Japan. There are going to be those who are industrialists who look at the cold hard facts of how much industry Britain has and the size of its empire versus the size of Japan and go whoa. And navalists who are going to look at it the size of the Royal Navy and the size of the Japanese Navy are not going to conclude that the Royal Navy is going to win this. 
So those three groups are all going to presume the Royal Navy of Britain is going to win this. In which case, America's got a problem, because if America, Britain wins this, Britain humbles Japan in the Far East, then America's whole position in the Far East is taken over by Britain. Britain goes from being their equal to being far more powerful, and especially as Britain's going to immediately start doing a war build, which they can justify because of war, etc. As I've said several times, the vote only goes to those people who show up. The input only goes to those people who show up. America's not going to want to be on the sidelines in this kind of conflict, so they're going to join in. In which case, you're probably going to be dealing with America, Britain, probably France, at the least, and the Dutch, plus all the empire and, and, and dominions and colonies forming an alliance and starting a, uh, and waging the war on one side. That is going to be a huge preponderance of force. Now, that's not going to come about quickly because it's going to take time for the Americans to get there. It's going to depend exactly on what circumstances the war starts. Because if the war starts with a massive outrage, then it's more likely the American leadership can mobilize their people to go, we've got to go this, they've outraged us, you know, their behavior. Now, this is the gentleman who you really have to think about. He's the chief of staff of the in, in Japanese Navy at the point here at this time. He's a member of the royal family well, by marriage and various other connections. Prince Ushimi Hiryoso. He is possibly the most powerful war hawk in Japan. I know we often associate it with the army. I know the traditional perspective that comes across is it's the army which were all pro war and the navy were, you know, these people were anti war. There were a fair number who were. But Nagano and Hiriyoso were very much pro war and very much believed Japan had been slighted. Now, they're slighted for two reasons. One, during the treaties, they wanted a 70%, not a 60%, a 70% equivalent. So they wanted it 10 10 7, not 5 5 3, as agreed at Washington. Also, interesting enough, and this is a reference to a recent video I put out about HMS Hood, and what if she had been used as the standard, the, uh, the, the size guide for warships after washing, uh, of Washington onwards. That would have suited the Japanese far more. The thing was, by restricting the Japanese as much as they did, the Americans secured their position, apparently. True. But they also made war almost inevitable, because they made it strategically scary enough for the Japanese. They couldn't feel confident. At 7 to 10, they would feel that they had a chance, and therefore there isn't enough margin of victory. Um, there isn't enough margin on the side of the Americans that the Americans can be confident of beating them, so they have to treat each other as pseudo-equals, if not equals. It's also the fact that if they'd been able to build their ships up to 40,000 tons, they would have been confident and happy with the ships they had, so they probably wouldn't have ended up breaking the treaty quite as dramatically as they did. It's one of those things. Never put in a rule in place which you can't enforce or which people can't stick to. You make the rule 35,000 tons, that's fine on paper, but in practice, we all know a little bit more would have made everyone feel a little bit happier because they'd have felt they could have built their ships that much better than their existing ones. However, the point is the Americans wanted it 15. 15 capital ships for them in Britain because they wanted to keep it cheap for them. Which they made it, which is why they made it five five three, because they were worried if it was ten seven and it was fifteen ships, then the Japanese would be allowed eleven, which wouldn't have been enough. This is Minister Mitsumasa Yonai, and he is critical in this period because he is Minister of the Navy from February nineteen thirty seven to August nineteen thirty nine. He is not a war hawk at all. He has a very critical uh, view of 
how Japan can conduct themselves. He has ideas for how they could win a war, but he doesn't think they're prepared for it, and he doesn't think they should go to war. He's a very, very loyal admiral, and these are the parting words of the emperor when he finishes his role as Minister of the Navy in December 1945. I really appreciated your duty and effort not to begin the war. I think we're not going to meet often like before. He put a pen and an inkstone in a, into a case and said, these are things that I've used. I would like to present this as a gift. To now, one of the interesting things is last time when I brought this up and when I talked about Mr. Masayono, uh, there was a great in discussion about what kind of pen it was, whether it was a pen pen or whether it was uh, the Japanese and uh, the Asiatic writings of the stylus. And I am more and more convinced by the Japanese sources I have managed to get hold of since then that it is very much the Asiatic style discussion. And it was a very personal gift from an emperor. Getting a personal gift from the emperor is a big sign of affection and respect, and it's a very great honour. Now, the point is, I'm trying to make, is if this officer is in charge at the beginning of a war, of a war with the UK and with the war, then you will be dealing with a different Japan. Japan, one of its problems is it overextends itself, and it then can't build itself back up. I don't think he would make this mistake. He is a calm, methodical thinker. He is beloved by his sailors, which is not always the case with Japanese officers. And he is very, very capable. Now, this is the chief of staff. And he is an absolute nightmare of an officer in some respects because he has a very, very massive ego and he really does believe that he can win. So you've got those two personalities of leadership. When Nagano is the Minister of the Navy and etc., there is a different scenario going on. But. With those two personalities in, you have probably the makings for an aggressive naval policy, but whereas Prince Hiroyoshi can cow most officers, he cannot cow Mitsumasa Yonai. In fact, at several points, the basically, because this man is so trusted by the Emperor, when the Prince tries his usual machinations to try and discredit this officer, the Emperor himself says the words, I am satisfied with his conduct. Which doesn't sound like a rebuke, but let's put it this way. If the Queen of Queen Victoria, or the, that sort of, sort of era we're talking about, if the monarch in that period says, you are there slagging someone off, and they say, I am satisfied with their conduct, basically that slams you down and puts you in the corner. Without them having to say them doing it. They're not doing anything that you can rise and say as a person. Like, but you've basically been told to shut up. And everyone else in the room has just been told, as far as the Emperor is concerned, they like this guy, so he's untouchable. You would have a far more powerful and probably far more cognizant and cogent debate going on in Japanese war councils. Again, there are officers, including Nagano, who like to go to sleep in these councils, whereas Yonai is the older man and is never asleep and will pick up on the slightest thing. You know, at several points, various, uh, Japan uh, various Japanese generals do not like, uh, want to challenge him and want to try and assassinate him. He killed off assassin more than he assassinated himself. With his, uh, you know, he's a, his father trained him as a samurai. He is a very skilled individual warrior, and he use, has used those skills to defend himself. I'm about as big a fan of Mitsumasa Yonai as it's possible to be, without being really that fluent in Japanese. Because... 
if I was writing the book I would like to write about looking at the different developments and maybe leading leading to World War Two, this would be my Japanese Henderson counterpart. And Admiral Henderson, as you know, was third sea lord in charge of construction for the Royal Navy and did all sorts of things with ship design. Yonai is another example, and it's strange enough both of them have to do compromises on battleships to in order to get everything else through. Henderson has to accept 14-inch guns on the King George V, and Yonai has to accept that the Yamato class are actually built, when he considers them a complete and utter waste of time, effort, energy, and money. Okay, so specifics of the Kantai Kesson, which is an important part of the Japanese doctrine if you're looking through all the different players. Achieve a local superior force that allows you to overwhelm your enemy to deliver a devastating blow. It's an army achieved by a concentration of the total fleet force, and it's rooted to an extent on, in one interpretation of Mahan. Mahan is very popular in Japan, and there is a reason for this. Mahan speaks to not the preservation of maritime supremacy, as Corvette does, and to an extent Richmond. Mahan speaks to the creation of naval supremacy, and he provides arguments which you can use to wage against an army when you're trying to make cognizant arguments for why your navy needs to exist. Now, in, in terms of the Kantai Kesson, also thanks to the Battle of Toshima, the Japanese have enshrined this decisive battle into their mythology. Now, we will leave to one thing. There is one small problem if you look at Toshima. It's against a fleet which has sailed around the world and is coming up in disorder. And Rosensky has done the best job he can do. I mean, honestly, that man deserves medals, parades. Frankly, if the fact that there isn't a statue of him in every single Russian naval base on the earth, I do not know why. Because what that man achieved is frankly amazing compared to what he started with. And the fact he got a fleet out there in anything like semblance of fighting order at all is just a feat of logistics and organisational skill and leadership beyond anything that would normally be achievable. But he had. But the thing is, of course, he gets beaten by the fleet, which is just there. The thing is, and the problem with the Kantai Kesson, is to an extent it relies on your enemy always behaving in that way. Now. Do we imagine the Royal Navy would turn up a la the 2nd and 3rd Russian Pacific Squadrons? No. <laughs> the answer are no. Uh, would the Royal Navy turn up with... What would they turn up with? And what would the US Navy turn up with? No. Okay, so key points looking at, uh, look for in a Kantai Kesson, if they're going to use it is it will always be deployed against a significant portion of the enemy fleet. So the enemy fleet has to be on a mast in order for you to begin with. This is why the attack on 4C is not a decisive battle, because whilst, yes, it's two capital units, which is an important part of the Royal Navy's forces in the Far East, it's nowhere near an important part of the entire fleet as a whole. They have many more capital ships. You're also looking for a portion of the ja a large portion or even the whole of the Japanese fleet involved in the operation. It takes place it tends to take place close to Japan. Um, and it will be applied in different ways. But the Kantai Kesson is not the only doctrine we have to look for. There is also the fact Taikan Koyoshugi, or big ships and big guns which is a doctrine which Mitsumasa Yonai has a real problems with, but the Prince um, Kiryoso is absolutely obsessed with. And basically, it means that the Japanese are always trying to look for bigger guns and bigger ships. But you notice that doesn't, see, that doesn't say balanced ships. That doesn't say well-rounded ships. It just says big ships and big guns. But of course, 1939, well, the Yamatos are draining Japanese resources, but they're not anywhere near available. 
Now, Yugeki Zengen Sakusen, or Interception Attrition Operations. It became dogma in the late 1930s, and I would say this is the one most likely to be seen, but we'll be discussing it in this operation. Firstly, at the start of hostilities, the Navy would destroy the USS Asiatic fleet, and in cooperation, the Army seized Luzon in the Philippines and Guam. These actions would eliminate American strongholds in the Western Pacific. But of course, we're dealing with a war against the British. You did, well, you can destroy the China Station Squadron. They're all cruisers sailing around. You can probably find them and hunt them down at some point, but they're going to cause you trouble while they're doing it, and they're also quite a long way from you. Especially if they withdraw back to Singapore. Now, Hong Kong hasn't been reinforced at this point, but um, Singapore has its peacetime professional garrison, not the garrison it would have in 1941 42. So there's a lot more troops there. There's a lot more troops in India. There are all those various forces in Australia, etc., ready to be mobilized and called up. And there's the fact that, again, with Singtao in 1939, it's not exactly an incident which the Japanese were looking for. So they're not going to be any more mobilized than anyone else's. So, yes, whilst the British forces have technically longer to come from, there are sufficient forces locally with the area that reinforcements can be quickly dispatched. And you need a lot less troops to defend a point than you need to attack it, especially when you have people who actually understand the area and are your theoretical, at least A, B, and A and B teams, rather than your C team and D team, actually ready there to defend it. Some Marines would proceed to the Eastern Pacific, where they monitor movements of the main American fleet. This, uh, they would attract the American forces, uh, set out westward, and attack it repeatedly to measure strength. I would presume, and my understanding from reading this is that also uh, proceed south. I'm prepared to do the same for any Royal Navy force coming through the South China Sea. Third, naval aircraft based in the South Seas and Navy Islands, i.e., Micronesia, would attack the enemy once he came within range. Carryborne aircraft would further reduce its strength. A good idea. But to be honest, to have a chance of doing that, they are going to have to attack the Philippines. So there is the fact that the Japanese could declare war with Britain and then have to invade the Philippines anyway to try and secure the South China Sea. Because otherwise, if you think about the South China Sea, there is no Japanese presence in there and the Royal Navy can come up. And what's the Royal Navy's first target probably going to be? Probably Taiwan. Take Taiwan, use that as a base, move forward, then take Hong Kong uh, back or relieve it. Then move on to Wei Hai Wei, and from Wei Hai Wei, start implementing some form of um, blockade on Japan. This is what the British strategy probably will be, broadly speaking. We'll talk about that in a second. Fourth, an advanced body of cruisers and destroyers supported by fast battleships would deal a major blow to the American fleet in a night attack. This would occur once the enemy had reached the seas, designated for decisive battle, and would con constitute the first phase of this battle. Now, the odds are that's also what they're going to do to the Brits. But where would they be doing it to the Brits? Because the Americans are coming across from over here. And when this is first being written, the Americans are based back in San Francisco, not in Hawaii. So they're a long way away coming across. But the Brits are based coming from down this direction. They're going to mass at Singapore and pulse forward from Singapore. Which is closer. Don't get me wrong, it's closer. But um, that's a lot more complicated waters to get into because there's French in the China, which has a French force base there. There's the Dutch East Indies. There are the Americans in the Philippines. That's something you've got to deal with. You either got to pacify in terms of diplomacy, neutralize militarily as a reality of it, or withdraw or fight. Or alternatively, concede the ground, in which case the Royal Navy doesn't mind, and give the South China Sea over to your submarines entirely. The British aren't gonna mind you doing that. Because where is British trade? All the other side of there. 
<laughs> now, that's the thing. For the British, war in the Far East of Japan is probably the dream scenario. They are far away from the trade links. They're not going to block the Mediterranean. And, you know, that's just brilliant. Ambush strategy. Yogeki Sakusen. This is sometimes referred to as the knife attack, but it's the it's a major part of the Japanese idea for how to achieve this sort of win. There are two problems with this. One, the British are already starting to deploy radars on their ships. So the British are already starting there. The Japanese are a little bit behind on that one. And whilst the Japanese probably do have the edge when it comes to long lance torpedoes and destroyer and cruiser attack torpedo attacks at night, I would say they have an edge in that one. I would say the British are probably the equi are equivalently well versed and equivalently competent in, competent in different ways at night fighting. They definitely have night strike capability for their aircraft, swordfish, which are not as behind the times in, 19, in February 1939 as they will be by 1940, 1941. Okay, in February 1939, there the, the swordfish does not look anywhere near as out of date as it might look to eyes when we're looking at it, comparing it to the aircraft of 1940, 41. There is a difference. There is a lot of stuff crammed into development into 1939-1940. And this is what you're sort of going to be balancing. It's, yes, the Japanese have long-range torpedo, but the British are just as good at night fighting with guns. Um, probably better in some ways, not as good in others, but the equivalently is good. So at long-range torpedo attack, Japanese probably have the advantage. But there again, are the British going to do the American, like the Americans did in that battle, in, a, in one of those battles, and keeps going straight in a straight line? Or will they be automatically weaving? And that's a tough one. But if you, again, you, you do have something you can go and look at the performance of the British in World War II as it began. And they're zigzagging the whole time because not because they think of ships, but because they think of submarines. It's a legacy of World War One. The moment war starts, they start zigzagging. They they they're not. It's not based on a belief of the enemy might have long range. Uh, uh, enemy might have long range torpedoes from their destroyers and cruisers. It's based on they might have torpedoes from their destroyers, their submarines, which we may or may not be able to see. Even though we've got Asdik, we're not going to place a hundred percent faith in it. And that might well give the British, how do I put this? They're still going to probably suffer from those long-range torpedo attacks, but they won't suffer as much because of that fear of submarine torpedoes. Because I don't think they're going to, I don't, the Japanese submarine torpedoes are going to perform as probably as much as they normally do. Anyway, so we have a small a, a split going on between Japan. We have the... Uh, Taikoko Kogobo Hoshin, or the Imperial Defense Policy, and the Taikoko Yohei Koryo, Imperial Defense Doctrine. The two things can actually be different. They can argue at cross purposes and occasionally. But broadly speaking, the Navy shall conduct operations aimed at annihilating Seymour forces of the enemy insofar as possible by forestalling him and the army at gaining the advantage of holding the initiative by rapidly concentrating the required force in area before the enemy can do so. So, do I expect an attack on Singapore? It's one of those interesting things the British expect it, but I don't. And I have a reason for this. I think if they're going to go amphibious, they go amphibious against the Philippines first, before they go to Singapore. Because there is no point trying to attack Singapore, even if you win, if you don't neutralize the Philippines behind you. Because then your troops are just cut off, surrounded, and the British will come take you back. And again, this will be the Indian Army, which hasn't had to be deployed to Iran, hasn't had to be deployed to North Africa, hasn't had to do all sorts of things in the Middle East. It's going to be the cream of the Indian Army. It's going to be the cream of the British Army, which is going to be deployed. The British Expeditionary Force, which goes deployed to Europe, is going to probably be the force which is deployed to the Far East. 
because Britain doesn't have multiple expeditionary forces, they only have the one. Will they deploy all of it? Uh, yeah, who knows. I wouldn't be surprised if at least there's an armoured division deployed. Um, probably seven. Judging by the various armoured units I looked at from the British armoured formations. Um, again, it comes quite interesting to see which officers are going to be playing the part of the British command structure. Because it will affect them. And again, you, you end up with the odds are that Cunningham gets deployed. Yes, he's the command. Seems, he's soon to be seen seeing Mediterranean. There is a, fair, a fairly decent admiral there already who can, uh, who can serve as theatre commander. That's fine. He'll probably stay as theatre commander. But sending out someone like Cunningham as fleet commander will make sense. Um, Somerville is ill. So, what am I saying? Um, well, Kantai Kessen is important. Part of Yohai Koro and the Japanese doctrine. But I don't think in this scenario it's going to be the be all and end all. Whilst it is included in references to the Southern Expansion Doctrine, which is Nashin Wong, which is probably the guiding overall philosophy of any of this war, especially if people like. Um, Hiroso and Nagano have their way. Yonai is going to moderate that to an extent. In fact, I don't think the Japanese go looking for a decisive battle a long way. I think they expect the British to come to them. And I think they will employ their ambush strategy. I think they will employ their let me go back to it so I make sure I pronounce it properly. The Yugeki Zengin Sakusen inception at interception and attrition operations to the maximum in any war scenario versus the British. This will be interesting. Because honestly, when it comes to rearming, the British are a little ahead. There's also something else which is going to happen. Yes, the British will order the corvettes probably at the same time. They'll still order the flyer class corvettes at the same time as they do traditionally. But there won't be any stop of the construction of battleships or carriers. Why? Because a war in the Far East is going to depend upon those things. Only a moron would think they wouldn't. It wouldn't. And thank God, again. In this part of 1939, war breaks out, probably Chamberlain isn't going to fall, because Chamberlain's been talking about war in Europe. War in the Far East happens, well, that's not on him, that's the Japanese. And yes, he hasn't defended his enough and all those things, but... Hmm? Also... There are reasons for building things. So actually, you might end up with the British surging ahead with cruisers, carriers, battleship construction, because those larger ships are what you really need for fighting a war in the Far East when you're dealing with the distances you're going over. And you don't need the mass convoy horde. The reason you don't need the mass convoy horde is because the war is mostly going to be happening well outside of your trade at your trade protection zone. You still need to build your co your convoy ships. And Probably it's quite good. You can increase their construction and maybe get Canada and other nations involved in their construction and maybe even some merchant ship, crash merchant ship construction because you need to supply the forces in the Far East. All good things. But um, you don't need to worry about Japanese submarines bobbing around in the Atlantic. You don't need to worry about Japanese submarines bobbing around probably in the Indian Ocean as long as you can keep them out of Singapore. In fact, Singapore becomes an interesting strategy at this point, because if you don't have the war in Europe, you have a lot of forces you can deploy there. And you have a lot of good generals you can deploy there. And I wouldn't be surprised if you do get some of the better generals deployed there and taking command. 
as said, I think you would find the American American goal. I'll leave that to one side. Now, here is an interesting thing to consider from a Japanese perspective. We talked about the British stopping building. Yamato class, they're not even launched in 1940. Now, Taiken Yugo Keigo Shugi seems to be the dictator of the Yamato class. They're not deterrent factors, they're not made enough knowledge of them. Big ship, big guns. Big guns, big ships. But they're also quite fast battleships. And with 18 inch guns, they can do a rapid hit of a battle group and then withdraw. Come in, blast away, and get out of there. So, Yugeki Zengen Sakusen is a possibility, and of course, for the Kantai Kasum. So, they fit in the doctrine. They're just, for Japanese industrial capacity, massive waste. Now, this is what Nagano says in 1941. According to the opinion of the Japanese government, if Japan accepts the modern United States, Japan will perish. However, if Japan fights against the United States, Japan may perish. That is, accepting the request of the United States will destroy Japan without fight uh, fighting the United States. Even if we fight against the United States, Japan cannot avoid the danger of extra uh, extinction. If Japan defeats without fighting, fight, if Japan defeats without fighting the United States, the Japanese people will truly disappear from the earth. However, if Japanese people can fight and show the spirit of defending Japan, even if Japan fights against America, other sen even if America Japan fights against America, other than other sense will always rebuild Japan. We hope to solve problems in diplomatic negotiations. Unfortunately, we'll be fighting if we are to be commanded to wage war. I think that makes more sense in Japanese, but I think broadly what he's saying he's saying, and he's part of the war party, is that Japan is going to lose whether it fights or doesn't fight, so it might as well go down swinging. <laughs> the thing is, they open with a war of aggression, which is why Singtao possibly could work out. So, here is the official write up of Singtao. Happens in January 1939, but this is the write up as written up in April 1939. On recorded in the China letter. HMS Birmingham was ordered to Tsingtao to investigate and to obtain the vessel's release. The Japanese Navy disclaimed responsibility for arrest, and the Commissioner of Customs at Tsingtao stated that he did not wish to detain her. In view of uh, these disclaimers, Captain Brind announced that he intended to sail the ship in company with HMS Birmingham from Shanghai for Shanghai at 0800 on the 30th of January which he did after having placed an armed guard on board her for the night of the 29th 30th to prevent any further interference with the ship. Investigations at Shanghai showed the ship had, in fact, committed a technical breach of the customs regulations by not having port of Funing endorsed on her papers. Assurances were received from Admiral Nomura at Shanghai that no order was issued by the Japanese ships for the St. Vincent de Paul to stop, in the view of the fact that the Japanese Navy had been presented with a fait accompli, these assurances were accepted, and the matter ended as far as the British and Japanese navies were concerned, being left to the customs and consular authorities for final settlement. This was reached with the decision to impose on the owners of SS St. Vincent de Paul a fine of $300. Nice. Sounds lovely. Reality is somewhat different. The reality, and this comes from the article linked down below, which is I wrote myself on Globe Maritime History. After almost a day of tense diplomacy that had commenced immediately upon the arrival of HMS Birmingham, both Captain Eric Brind and the Singtail Consul General, Mr. A.J. Martin, Henry Hadley Derry, according to some files, um, these meetings were heavy going and were apparently going nowhere. Frustrated by the very senior officer's absence due to it being a Sunday, 
And the moderate, moderately senior officers claiming no knowledge of why it had happened, so much so that, in fact, when coupled with the in, uh, in, incidents of in Japanese interference with the boats, Captain Brin decided to force the issue. Therefore, he announced that the British ships would be leaving at 0800 hours the next day. Almost as soon as he announced this, Captain Brin ordered a party to go and secure the merchant ships. Whilst the night was passed relatively peacefully, thanks in part to the gangway being, having been raised, first thing in the morning there was an attempted boarding of the SS Vincent de Paul, but as diplomatic resisted by an RN party led by a 19 year old midshipman and future Admiral of the Fleet, Edward Ashmore, which had been stationed aboard earlier. In the morning, the ships all got their engines warmed up and are ready as soon as early as possible, forming up with HMS Folkestone in the van and HMS Birmingham protecting the rear. Folkestone, of course, being a sloop. What has been going on at harbour, A.J. Martin, the consul, had been having an absolute nightmare. After the previous day, he'd gone back to the consul, only to uh, only woken uh, uh, by phone call from Mr. Yamoto, um, the head of customer service in Tsingtao, who earlier the day had claimed he had no interest in the instance Vincent Nepal. Mr. Yamoto had a question, which went right to the heart of the issue. Rather than being at his Yang, as her papers cleared for, the instance of Vincent Nepal had, along with the Norwegian, been at Xi'an Mu as shown by photographs taken by aircraft, many miles apart. After uh, midnight, there was, though, no chance of communicating with the ships. The concert didn't have a radio. Upon being told Mr. this, Mr. Yamoto responded, if a ship left before the matter was cleared up, it would be dangerous. Not exactly phraseology that would have had reduced Mr. Martin's worries. Martin, in contra, in true style of the foreign office in China, calmly asked what the danger was, whether the Japanese the Navy would open fire upon the British ships, before waiting for an answer. He carried on to inform Mr. Yamamoto that it would be quite impossible for a telegram to reach Shanghai by 0800 hours, so the Japanese authorities would be solely responsible for any consequences. 1930s diplomatic speak for, This situation is not going to end well if you are not saying what I think if you are not saying what I think you are saying, so why not think again, preferably quickly? This firm approach, echoing Captain Brin's stance earlier, announcing his time for leaving, resulted in the head of the customs stating he was merely a messenger, and then, to, uh, to, uh, then took his leave. Only to return a few minutes later to inform Mr. Martin that he could send a letter out to Notre Dame by launch, stating he needed an answer by uh, need an answer by a such a time on the Hsiang Shanghai issue, and also offering to take a letter for Mr. Martin along too. Unsurprisingly, Mr. Moto was taken up on this offer. But the messenger, a junior customer officer, returned at 0130 hours on the 30th to say the Japanese Navy would not allow him to even get onto the pier let alone aboard a launch, and further, his late arrival was owing to uh, being prevented taking a straight route by their sentries. What this illustrates is, despite being able to communicate, the Japanese were apparently unable to work together, as well as the British, who couldn't talk to each other, or perhaps weren't willing to. Either way, the scene was set for later that morning. So in a hundred hours, after starting his ships and withdrawing his party from SS Vincent de Paul, Captain Brind had his little convoy begin their move. During the passage up, Birmingham and HM HMS Shigara Squadron all had their guns trained on each other, at full action stations. Brind went so far as to assign turrets to each of the Japanese ships, focusing on their bridges. That this incident had passed off peacefully under such circumstances was a testimony to the strength of the presence uh, the RN had managed to mobilise regarding legacy, personnel and vessels within the Far East, as well as to the confidence that their crews had to hold firm in the face of such overwhelming enemy strength. And, of course, the Ashigara is the vessel at the bottom, Birmingham's vessel at the top, and here, and uh, there were f at least three of her class in that harbour, all pointing their guns. Uh, the fourth turret, by the way, was focused on the headquarters ashore of Birmingham. <laughs> Basically, it was a case of, you will take that ship, you will take that ship, you will take that ship, and you will take that ship. And before people go, well, that's six-inch guns, that's eight-inch guns, that's gonna, those are going to win. They are. We're talking ranges measured in hundreds of yards in the nicest way. At this point, it doesn't matter whether they're firing six inch, four inch, or whatever they're going to, they're going to penetrate. Okay. There is, they are, it's not even point blank range. We are talking about sniffing distance. We are talking about, we can see the whites in their eyeballs. We can not, we can also distinguish the pupil color and everything else on our opponent. We can tell you what he had for breakfast by smelling his breath. We are so close. That is what we're talking about range. No fighting. Didn't happen. However, let's diverge from history. How do we diverge from history here? Well, the divergence is quite simple, really.
HMS Folkestone is at the front. I have no doubt if they'd fired, then Birmingham would have fired, and the base it was a hairline trigger. Everything was set up on Birmingham, as I understand it, that literally press one button, the shells go. As far it's all on the central direct control. So the time between firing and the firing of the shells would have been instantaneous. The odds are the Japanese lose at least one, if not all three heavy cruisers at that range. The British definitely lose Birmingham. I'm sorry, there's no way. There are 20 plus odd 8 inch guns aimed at her. Nearly 30. There is no chance. I, I, I love a town class cruiser. There is no chance. Unless all the shells manage to magically pass through without hitting anything. Um, or go put over her or something. And she takes them all out in the first go. There is no chance. Pretty much, Birmingham's crew will probably be blown asunder. Um, Japanese cruisers will be out the wall. Will they be sunk? Doesn't really matter. They're going to be wrecked. Even if they only get one round of shells, but they might get a couple. Uh, they might get a couple of salvos off, but probably one salvo. Three six-inch shells hitting at that range are going to cause a tremendous amount of damage. Especially, you know, the way he's got them aimed. He's got them so that they're sighted up to wipe out the entire superstructure. Which is going to cause trouble for the whole ship. And he's also got a torpedo ready to be swung out. Although, <laughs> one of the things, this is one of the little points. The torpedo also goes, we might be so cl too close for the torpedoes to actually arm. Was one of the discussions. And I found this. I, I, I found this particular torpedo discussion in a torpedo officer's discussion back in, uh, later on in World War Two, and this was the officer who'd also been on one of the officers, torpedo officers on Birmingham, and were basically going, "Yeah, uh, they were discussing close how close they could arm torpedoes to," and he went, "Well, when in January 1939, when I was doing this, we were actually not sure whether there was any point in firing torpedoes. We were that close." We basically worked out there's a the, the cruiser furthest away from us is the only one we have a chance of actually doing anything to. But good note and good news, the torpedoes are already are, are most quickly to be orientated that way. We can flick them around so that we've got them positioned so we can flick them around straight away. Now the thing is, Bogston probably survived and probably gets away. She's small. Doubt the, uh, the Japanese are aiming at, but she'll be firing her four inch gun merrily. But there won't be much left for the Japanese to carry on doing much else. She's got radios, and she will start blasting away with her messages. So it doesn't matter really how far she gets. If she gets home, uh, back, uh, she gets back to base, that's great. If she doesn't. But she sends off her messages. And so, as far as the world will have it break up, the Japanese have and just blown up the proof of it in the ship's log. Um, have just attacked the British Navy, which was in technically a neutral port, although Singtao or Qingdao had been given to the Japanese after the Germans had had it in World well, War had lost it in World War One. How does this ricochet, ricochet around the world? Well, you sank HMS Birmingham. Um, expect there to be a third Queen, a uh, third Edinburgh subclass built. Honestly, that's going to be straight away because that's going to be called HMS Birmingham. Okay, um, that that's an obvious HMS Birmingham will be resurrected as quickly as possible. And the reason I say not a crown colony or something like that, instead of a, a full up Edinburgh class, is because honestly, the Ronnie would like another one of those, and they are still technically close enough in construction they can order without it looking fun. Um, but that won't be in service for at least another two years, and I doubt the war would go on that long. So, 
The British forces will start moving. First of all, they're going to decide which officers are going to be in charge of what and what they're going to be doing. Uh, in my world, I would say Cunningham would probably be Fort Fleet Commander, and Theatre Commander be left with Admiral Noble, who's already out there. Noble is an experienced officer who understands the Japanese and understands the Americans, has good relations with both, and understands both very well. He's a fine theatre commander for this kind of a war, as long as you give him a sufficiently aggressive, fighty enough admiral to charge his fleet. You will probably have the first force will arrive from the Mediterranean fleet, which is another reason why Cunning will be the fleet commander. He'll be collecting crews as he goes, but he'll probably be bringing out his Trouble Class Destroyers and a couple of other of his flotillas. He'll probably be bringing out some of his... Oh, by the way, that on top is, Cap is Captain Later Admiral Brind, the gentleman in charge of HMS Birmingham. Let's be honest, that guy's a very brave guy, and this is Harwood. And the reason I have Harwood here is, again, Harwood's force could well get drawn in from the South Atlantic, because you could bring crews across from, the, from there, and the whole thing will be generating. Okay? The Royal Navy will be generating forces. So the battle cruisers that are available could repulse, probably will be going straight off. Renown is sort of going to be available not too long now, sis. The Queen Elizabeth's, uh, Nelson and Rodney, all the ones of those that are available, will be going. And that will be the core of the Royal Navy battle group is going. I do not expect them to deploy the R-Class battleships. The R-Class battleships will stay with the Home Fleet and the Mediterranean to, re to preserve the British positions there. This is where it comes important. Do allies take part? Do allies not take part? I think France might join in. And as said, I think if you have a major attack like this, you have France, you probably have the Netherlands, because they both ride on the British coattails to, sent in the Far East to deal with the Japanese. So they have to reinforce the British. And again, imagine how the news we played out in America who has already got problems and issues with Japan, there's a huge issues going back and forwards. Suddenly this unprovoked attack on the Royal Navy, free cruisers ambushing it under the flag of parley and truce, coming in to deal with an issue. I, I, you, you can imagine it. Brave, heroistic British crew massacred. I think America would end up getting involved. I think America. W I think that. I think that's what they'd be playing it as. But I think cynically, it's a case of they don't want the British to do it on their own because the British do it, then the American position in the Far East suffers. So there you go. You now have World War Two, and you do have World War Two. What is the doctrine for the Japanese going to be? Well, they're going to be there for having to deal with. The British, but in nicest way, they cannot afford to blow, forget the Americans. The Americans are not at Hawaii, so they're not within close strike range, and the Japanese do not have the options the British do. The British plan is very much likely going to be deploy a first force from the Mediterranean to Singapore. I've discussed in the past in previous videos about their plans for various tankers to be based at points on the route, the tankers would go to, uh, are already to extent, operating in those areas, would go to those positions, be waiting to refuel en route in a nice, secure facility so they don't have to convoy the tankers, their tankers once they are protected, and massing their fleet at Singapore before pushing up. They're also going to probably withdraw China Station forces to Singapore, but the cruisers are probably going to go surface raiding while on their way back. I mean, they are going to literally be doing the best they can to muck up the Japanese in any way, shape, or form. Starting from Shanghai, those forces, along with the carrier they have present, are going to be causing trouble. Britain's going to start the mobilization. And it's going to involve deploying troops to Singapore and India. And probably some troops to Australia as well. 
and it's going to be bringing the Metrania fleet first, as I said, bringing Cunning with them, and then probably ships from the home fleet. So it's going to be a two-stage reinforcement. Once they get there, well, the British plan for the Far East basically resembles a naval maritime version of the Anaconda plan, and every British war plan seems to be dealing with, I don't know, Spanish Armada. It's clear area, move forward, set up forward base. Clear area beyond it, move forward, set up forward base. Clear area, move forward. And that is a very metaphorical. Do not expect the British aren't going, planning on fighting the war from Singapore. Singapore is a theatre support base. They want to, if they're planning on doing a blockade of Japan, they want to do that from way high way. That's about the distance they want to be operating from. Most importantly, though, they want to secure Singapore because as long as they can secure Singapore, the Japanese can't go this way. Well, they can try, but they're going to run out of fuel. And there's probably going to, there might even be an R class battleship sent down to uh, the Falklands just to make sure anything does try and go through. It goes, oh, wow, you're sufficiently beaten up by the South Atlantic that I can have some fun with you. And the South Pacific and the South Atlantic, that you, I can have a lot of fun with you. And the poor Japanese ship is going, but you're an R-Class battleship. You shouldn't be having fun with me. And the R-Class probably going, well, I'm called Royal Oak. I'm the one upgraded R-Class battleship. Your dinner. Japanese plan. Well, how quickly can they mobilize? And who do they hit first? Which is a problem, because... Sensibly, if you don't want to widen the war, and if the Americans are not part of it, you don't want to widen the war, you go after the British, and you go to Singapore, you try and attack Singapore. But to attack Singapore is a long route. You have to mobilise, get your troops from your area of China, or from Japan, and deploy them all the way down. That's going to take a long time. And the odds are the reinforcements from the Mediterranean fleet are going to get there before that, and the they are going to escort across, because probably behind them is going to be troop ships from India. There are going to be a lot of soldiers sitting there. And again, they're going to have good commanders. And it's not going to be to an extent... When you're coming from India, uh, from India China, or well, Vietnam, you can get into Malaya, Asia that much easier and get down through there to get to Singapore. Whereas... Do it sensibly. The British troops can probably hold it. Singapore won't fall like it did. That's if they try for Singapore, though. I am... The more I look into it, the more and more convinced I think about with Yonai, etc. Mr. Masa Yonai won't want to attack Philippines. Hirioso and Nagano will, though. I think, possibly, they think that they will think that if they can take the Philippines, then they can bounce from there to Singapore, or they can block the British. They might even go for, uh, well, they already do have some troop, uh, personnel in Taiwan. So they could go for that and reinforce that. But it's going to be a complicated scenario. They're going to have to work things through. Because if they go offensive, that's fine. They can probably take the Philippines. But they will also find themselves in trouble in that then they will start, uh, definitely start a war with America. If they don't take the Philippines and they go racing to try and get to Singapore, they probably arrive after, arrive after the first load of reinforcements that the British have arrived. Because remember, reinforcements don't have to take as much with them as troops who are conquering. And so they can be organized more quickly. Um, then we have the fact that the Japanese Navy is going to be very different. 
the Japanese Navy is not going to include a Kido Batai on mobile unit force because uh, that's not created until 1941. And in fact, in 1913, January 1939, the IJN could call on Akagi, Kaga, Soryo, Hoso, and Rijo. Those are your carriers. Hiryu is commissioning in July 1939. Zuho is commissioning in December 1940. Shokaku is launched in June 1939, and Zukaku is launched in November 1939. In simple terms, you could probably Probably rush to an extent Hiryu and Zuho. You can probably rush those to an extent. Do I think they'll be available to take part in any operations in February 1939? I doubt it. March, April, May, maybe. Um, Zuho probably a little bit later than May, considering that ship had all sorts of oodles of fun trying to get it to do from construction to commissioning. The point is, the Japanese Navy we know, the romping, stomping Kido Batai of 1939, not only doesn't exist in terms of administration of organization, but doesn't exist in terms of ships in the water. This is not going to be that scenario. Yeah. The Japanese launching a daring carrier raid on Singapore is still possible. But again, there will be a difference because to get to Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor is not on a war footing. Singapore will be on a war footing because of how Singapore, uh, Singapore starts it. And the odds are there are going to be British submarines. And that's one of the things I, have to, I will point out. The British are going to be deploying submarines. They have a lot of submarines there in 1939. They would draw them off to fight World War II. But there are a lot of submarines out there. There are a lot of submarines in the Mediterranean and various other places which are which are basically penciled as deployable assets for the Far East. They have assets worked out. Which brings us back to the likely result. And this is one of those lovely plans the British have for war with Japan. And it's Japanese merchant shipping and what lines they operate on and where they're operating. And the British know about this because when it comes to the Asima Mara incident in 1940, where a Royal Navy town class cruiser HMS Liverpool plucks a Japanese merchant vessel, a pride of their fleet, their equivalent of, you know, Cunard liner, out of the ocean, not far from Tokyo Bay, to take off some German uh, individuals who are aboard and trying to get home, in what is a bit of an embarrassment for the Imperial Japanese Navy, and suggests they're quite impotent, the British know the Japanese merchant routes very, very well. That is where the British cruisers are going to live, as long as they're running. You end up with war with if you end up with war with America as well, that shuts that down. And remember, there's no tripartite pact at this point. We look at, if we go back to the uh, here, the tripartite pact, well, it claims a victim. Admiral Zengo Yoshida, who became Navy Minister in August 1939, is forced to resign from his post because of his opposition to the tripartite pact. Yeah. Yoshida, that man in the center there, who took over as Navy Minister after Yonai, who was a bit of a balanced soul, a Wilson -ish, almost figure, opposed the tripartite pact. It doesn't exist at this point. So that means Italy and Germany are completely free agents. Suddenly, won't well, or one about those two. But the British plan is going to be to go after Japanese trade. Japanese plan for trade protection is quite absolutely atrocious. 
<laughs> it really is. We know that because they don't have the industry and infrastructure to actually support building a train production fleet and build them at Yamato and Mashashi. And the fact is, Yamato and Mashashi are under construction at this point and are draining resources left, right and centre. So there is going to be nothing in the, um, in the barrel for it. So every time the British get further forward, the British are going to be operating for some rings forward. Now, if the British are starting off from Singapore, if the Japanese take Philippines, then the British and the Americans have to take the Philippines back before they can operate from there. If the Japanese don't take the Philippines, if Yonai says, look, we are going to be far better off letting them come to us, using our submarines and everything to trip them as they come to us in the East Japanese, the East China Sea, in the Japanese, yeah, the Japanese Sea, sort of this sort of area, um, sort of pointing to it, but that sort of area, and they trip them as they're coming up, and then counterattack, that'll be more sensible. I think, honestly, if they go the best way, that's the route they're not going. Will it win? No. The reason it won't win is your enemy's supposed to be stupid. They're supposed to keep coming even though they're, 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 they're losing ships. Whereas the British and Americans can both go, right then, we've lost enough ships, too many ships, we're going to draw. Build more ships, because they've got the industry building them and churning them out, and then we'll come forward again. And they're starting from having more ships in the first place. Then you've got ASDIC and the various other anti-submarine warfare systems the British have. I think that will have an interesting effect on Japanese submarines. But I also think the British fear of submarines, the British phobia towards submarines, as I said earlier, will have a fat impact on Japanese operations long lance torpedoes. Because whereas their mass torpedo volleys will have an, a distinct impact on the Americans who are for some reason slightly less afraid of submarines. I think at the beginning of the war, I think the British will be still zigzagging. And that will remove that as much of a pro That will change the dynamics. It won't be quite as devastating. They'll probably lose ships still. And more importantly, we'll probably have a lot of damaged ships. This is an interesting point to make. 8th of August, 1939, at the Five Ministry Commission that was intended to obtain the plan of the Venetian War, supposedly the Minister of Finance, Sotaro Isruata, who has no English wiki page, asked Yonai, the Minister of the Navy at the time, is it possible for the Imperial Japanese Navy to triumph over American, American Britain? Yonai answered, no. The Imperial Japanese Navy is not designed to open fire against them. The Third Reich and the Italian Navy are out of the question. Interesting fact. Uh, interesting sort of nugget. By the way, when Yonai serves as president, as prime minister, he resigns from the Navy, which means he doesn't, uh, doesn't combine the power base at all and, uh, of that role. He actually has to be recommissioned in the Navy to, take, uh, to take, uh, go back into it later on by the Emperor. So I think Japan's strategy will be a Trishimon. Um, I think they might be looking for a Tushima 2.0. They'll be looking for a big battle closer into Japan. Where they can deploy a lot of land-based air and other assets to assist the naval forces. I think it'd be interesting to see how the British and the Americans responded. I think this would be very much a maritime-based war. I think things like the Battle of Britain's loss, a cutting off of the Royal Navy's gull-winged sea fire, spitfire thing um, from submarine won't happen. I think we could see that in service, which would definitely be interesting. Um, I don't know how, I, I think, still think a European war happens. I'm sorry, I, I do. I'd love to say it didn't, but I'm, I'm sorry you're dealing with Hitler. 
and Mussolini, and those are two egos which is going to be interesting too. But you, you might well have a scenario where the French work out a lot of their command and control issues operating in the Far East. Because it might well delay war in Europe, because... There is one thing declaring war when the when all those people are disunited. There's another thing when they're united and America's already part of it and they're fighting a war. So you know if you fight, start attacking a war, you're going to be taking on all of them. Yes, there is an argument they're distracted, so you can take them on now while they're distracted. But there's a problem that they're also already united. They're already fighting as one. So I, I, I think that causes a calculation. I still think war in Europe happens. I'm sorry, I don't think we get past 1942 without it. But I think we have a war in the Far East that probably lasts till about 1941, end of, end of 1941. And the reason I think it's over in that time is once the Japanese Navy is defeated, which they will be, and Japanese islands are isolated, Without the Casas Belli of Pearl Harbor, and despite the British would be no doubt be outraged by what happened in Birmingham, the British are not quite the same in that regard. In that to an extent, extent, we expect those sort of things to happen occasionally. We don't want it to happen, but we expect them to be happen occasionally. And it's only again it's one ship, and it's not in our own harbor. I think a settlement might be reached. And then peace in the Far East. And I think that's the point to which the powers who have aligned together fighting Japanese will start arguing with each other, as they almost always do allies after a war. And I think that is the point at which the Germans and the Italians start doing this aggrandizement again. After they've used that intervening time of no one paying much attention to them to build up their forces, going, oh, we can't be limited by treaty. Look at how everyone's building up their ship troops. We're allowed to build up ours. So, yeah. That was what would happen. I hope that's answered those questions. Now, the Japanese doctrine? I think it'll be the attrition warfare. I think that's what they would go with. Honestly... I can't see any other possibility for them to go to. I think they would like to have a decisive battle, but I don't see them getting to a scenario where they're either going to be finding British task forces operating around, because again, the British have a task force operating mentality. They're going to be moving around in lots of little groups wandering around. Or they're going to find the major British fleet, but by the time they find a major British fleet, that's going to be operating under its own protection of cover of its carriers and moving up slowly and taking places as it goes. It, they're not, the British are not going to do a massive leap. That's not the British style of warfare. One of the interesting things you, you talk about quite regularly when you're discussing obvious warfare is uh, the American prevalency for doing a coup de main in one go, in that they tend to land straight into as close to the enemy as they can and then advance to engage. And overwhelming firepower, shock troops, and the structure. The British tend to land further away and mass their troops ashore and move up and use maneuver ashore. One is one depends on is based on speed and firepower. The other one is you can say the risk at less the risk a more risk adverse approach, but it's also tend to be the approach which someone reflect who's more maritime maneuver based than land maneuver based will go with so i think the british would do that they would do it and i think the japanese would be forced to react i don't think there aren't japanese are going to send a large fleet into the south china sea if they do that's going to be after they've already had the attack the philippines they're not going to do that without taking the philippines so it all depends on whether you and i in which case I think they have an attrition operation. Or if Hiriosa dominates, then I think they attack the Philippines. No. Hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found it interesting. And um, enjoy the 19th of March.
Right, what have we got coming up? Oh, well, uh, we've had the Glorious Heritage class accrue, uh, accru the system has come off, and we've got the Pathfinder class coming out on the 22nd of March, Ooh. which is the day when, I think, PayPal for fundraiser ends for Hyder. And uh, because of the Glorious Heritage class, because that's been quite so popular, that is going to be the theme of tomorrow's live. When this comes out on the 19th, the 20th of March is going to be a brew ships, which is sort of sci fi glorious heritage class looking at Andromeda and that sort of series. But um, I might also sneak some books in there. As always, thank you to Kaigan, thank you to Shokan. Thank you to the Imperial Japanese Navy, and there's also another Imperial Japanese Navy book around here somewhere, which I just spotted. Okay. And Imperial Japanese Navy by Mark Style, and this very cool book as well, Japanese Carriers and the Victory in the Pacific by Martin Sanzo. These books have been really, really useful in figuring this all out. That and the various links I put down below um, and various archival documents. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you found it interesting and useful. Thank you very much. Take care and have a nice day.